wonderful celebration of Andrew Sayer's contribution to the social sciences nationally and internationally. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Fortier. I'm here as Deputy Head of Department of the Sociology Department at Lancaster University to welcome you all to this wonderful event. Um, you'll be hearing a lot today about Andrew's significant intellectual contribution to methodology and theory in the social sciences. Um, so I want to say something a bit more personal about Andrew as a colleague and as a friend. Um, Andrew joined the department um, at Lancaster in 1993 and in his 27 years at Lancaster, he's been one of the most generous colleagues. He's a true citizen of the department and he's acted as head of department, MA director and other roles that I won't list here. He's always been willing to offer a helping hand and to support, <clears throat> sorry, um, a helping hand um, and support. And as you know, Andrew shies away from the spotlight and from the spotlight. And in that sense, despite his fame and achievements as a scholar, he's really the absolute op opposite of a diva professor. Um, so Andrew would be kind of quietly supporting colleagues and students uh, in a range of different ways, mentoring, advising, helping in progress and uplift of the careers of others and students' development, um, and you know, supporting younger colleagues, including myself when I was a early career researcher. Um, Andrew, you were a great support when I arrived and when I started um, as a early researcher. Um, as a colleague and as a friend, I will always appreciate your kindness, your quiet but reliable presence. So Andrew, I hope you, en you enjoy the celebration and I look forward to our next cup of tea and cake. And I hope you'll continue to enjoy retirement and that you won't be a stranger in our different events at the universe in the department. Congratulations, Andrew. Thank you, Anne-Marie. And we should say that Image and Tyler did want to be here as well, um, like most of the department. So she sends her apologies and, and again wants to say enormous thanks to you, Andrew, for everything that you've done over the years and the support that you've given to people. So you've certainly been an influence on me in lots of different ways. We've often argued about things as we've gone on parallel tracks, but we've always agreed on the absolute horror of injustice that we faced and we've tried to tackle it in different ways. And I think that's so important. I think what's also great about you is you never cease to surprise me and you're always working on something different and something new and I was saying one of my favourite papers recently is your paper on character uh, where you unearth you know these these strange university funded think tanks that are producing some very odd research uh, that actually condemns the working class so you, your curiosity is, is such an important part of you that I think we'll see celebrated by quite a lot of people today I I also think you may not be a diva professor but you certainly have a lot of righteous indignation <laughs> of the good kind and that is a compliment because I've seen through the years as you move through different types of books and different types of writing how you've actually got angrier and angrier at what you've seen around you and you use all your theoretical skills all your methodological knowledge your interdisciplinary perspectives to really tackle head on these problems and you know why we can't afford the rich is probably so significant because we can't but you make sure we know exactly why and you evidence it so well and write it so well so it's so important that we have you here and that we can celebrate you because I think what we see is that you've put so much into other people as Anne-Marie was saying 
what you've done is enable other people to take things on. You've given them the skills, the thinking, the challenge, the perspective, and a lot of evidence to work with. And so I think it's so important that we celebrate your academic career uh, in a way that we recognise you, and I know you don't like to be recognised in that way, but we recognise how much labour and intellect and little parts of you are actually in all of us in that we've all worked with your work we've all thought about your work and that's so important because that's how you leave a legacy you leave it because we're thinking in particular ways around particular issues and we can keep going back to your work i've got a pile here it was like which one am i going to concentrate on um, but you know we can keep going back and thinking that was so important now everybody here today and thank you all for coming and it was it was quite difficult to slim down the people who wanted to present to Andrew's better if so that that says quite a lot. Andrew wanted a small event, but we could have filled the whole week actually with people wanting to say thank you. So we have a small group here who I'm sure will will interrogate you in lots of different ways as well, <laughs> uh, because you would do the same um, as well as paying tribute. I think you've got to see it as an acknowledgement of how much you have made people engage and generate particular ideas and go into different fields with them. So really, really important. So the way we organise today for those who've come in, is we're going to have three panels. Uh, the first two panels will be about Andrew's work, in particular work on class, um, and then work on moral and political economies. Uh, we'll have a break in between, and then we'll go on to actually take different opinions from colleagues who worked with Andrew about what they found most enriching, interesting, challenging, um, whatever. So I think it's it's impossible in a very, and this is how, how I've decided, impossible in a very short introduction to go through all your books, although I have a list and Michael will place uh, the list and the programme for today so that people can follow through. But I think it's very important that we give time to those who, you know, feel they have benefited from their collaboration with you and sharing with you. So with that, you will have a chance, Andrew, at the end of each panel to respond uh, to the comments, just a short response at the end of each panel. And then at the very end, you'll have a chance to have a longer response to uh, the afternoon itself. So I hope it all goes well. We think we've got everything in place. And uh, <laughs> with, without ado, I'm going to hand over to Kevin, Kevin Morgan, who is currently at Cardiff, Professor of Governance and Development in the School of Geography and Planning. And Kevin was one of your earliest co-authors and I believe has been engaging and been in conversation with you ever since. So over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Many thanks, Bev. Can you hear me OK? Yeah. So I'm hoping Michael is going to put up my slides now. Michael, over to you. He said, hopefully. OK. Can everyone see those? Many, many thanks, Michael. So uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, can I thank Lancaster University, first of all, for inviting me to this very, very special uh, occasion? Uh, as, as you can all see, I'm, uh, I'm opening my presentation with a cover slide uh, of a typical scene from industrial South Wales, where, uh, where a, a lot of me and Andrew's uh, early work uh, was based. Uh, as you can also see that uh, I, I've been placed uh, in, the, in the panel on place, class and inequality. And I'll try to address very, very briefly uh, each of these themes as they've intersected in the work that Andrew and I have done over the years. So next slide, please, Michael. So very, very quickly, I, I want to address these uh, these three themes of place, class, inequality. Say something very briefly 
uh, about each of them. But I, I want to begin with on a personal note, and I want to end on a note where I think uh, we, uh, on a theme which I think consumes Andrew's current work today. And I hope it consumes all of us because it deals with our existential future. So, Michael, next slide, please. I don't want anybody to worry about this slide. I'm not about to begin to run through my holiday snaps. So please, uh, everybody relax. I I'm putting it up here because it, uh, it serves a serious purpose, uh, believe it or not. Uh, this is from a, a, a very, very memorable conference uh, in Naxos, Greece in 83. And, um, uh, and where Andrew and I were both invited individually to speak. And I only received an individual invitation because during my PhD years, uh, three or four years prior to this, Andrew had really opened up his international networks to me as a rookie doctoral student. It was an enormous privilege to meet some of the great social scientists working in my field. Uh, some of you may notice in the middle of that crowd, there's Doreen Massey, who was probably one of the most famous uh, geographers at the time and is now one of the most famous, sadly departed, one of the most famous social scientists of her generation. And on the left, there's Andrew, me and our partners, Hazel and Sue, uh, relaxing after a hard day in the office. But the point, the point is that it is quite extraordinary to meet international scholars when you're so early in your career. And uh, Andrew did this in an exemplary way to me, and I've tried to follow suit ever since with my own doctoral students. It's so important to be exposed to international thinkers early on in one's career. Next slide, please, Michael. As Bev said earlier, this was our first book together, a microcircuit of capital, which summarized two, two different ESRC projects, trying to deconstruct the so-called high-tech sector. And uh, it was incredibly well received, I've noticed recently, because I've only recently read the reviews of it. But what we tried to do in microcircuits was to show that at the dawn of the digital age, a new international division of labor was being uh, fashioned and, um, uh, and, 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 to, and to get some kind of traction on these new developments, these new geographies, if you will, we felt the need to offer a more granular analysis. It's easy to forget at the time now that the radical geographers in the 1980s were really beholden to a very, very abstract uh, kind of Marxist theory. And we took issue with some of this abstract theory because we thought there was a need to engage in more concrete analysis. Uh, famously at the time, uh, the most famous Marxist geographer, David Harvey, said that capitalists behave as capitalists wherever they are. At a general level, of course, that's true. But at a concrete level, it's manifestly not true. And we were engaged with trade unions and development agencies, and we needed more granularity to show that capital was powerful, yes, but it was also shaped by the regions in which it sought to locate, as we'll see on the next slide, Michael. So in terms of the class analysis in, in, our, in, our, in our book, we, 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 we try to address two dimensions of class. There was the capital versus capital dimension, what Marx famously called the hostile brothers dimension to capitalism. And we also addressed the capital labor dimension in one of the most heavily unionized regions in Western Europe. That is to say the coal and steel dominated unions of industrial South Wales. And through our analysis of these plants, we highlighted two novel features of a remaking of a labor tradition. One was the feminization of a workforce in a heavily male dominated industrial structure on the one hand. And then secondly, new forms of trade unionism. In many other regions, 
high tech was looking for union free factories. In South Wales, it had to adjust to unionism, but not traditional multiple unionism. It forged single union traditions, and that was a really novel feature of this new class formation in, 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 in South Wales. Next slide, please, Michael. Fast forwarding now to the, the recent present. This is the title of my essay in the Feshrift book, and it's an essay that's informed by two highly influential books uh, in my own career. Uh, Why Things Matter to People is probably my favorite Sayer book. It's a hard choice because there are so many, all books from Andrew have been excellent, but this book has a special appeal to me and I return to it time and time again and I use it on my research methods course. Why is that? Uh, God knows, but I think fundamentally it's because it offers the most compelling case I know uh, for normativity. Why normativity is not only acceptable, but necessary in a critical social science. So that I take this book in my essay, in my chapter as my point of departure, and I link it to a second influential book called Foundational Economy. Uh, for those, by the way, not familiar with Foundational Economy, it's, it, it's, it, it's addressed to what the book calls the mundane goods and services that keep us all safe, sound, and civilized. It provides the infrastructure of everyday life, and it's composed of two groups of sectors. Firstly, there's the material infrastructure of what we used to call utilities, digital connectivity, connectivity to water, electricity. In other words, the connected household. And secondly, it covers providential services, health, education, dignified elder care, and so on. These are the, this is the opposite end of the glamorous high tech. These are the sectors that really make a difference to the quality of life. And in my chapter, I simply argue, we need to move beyond moral economy. Uh, we need to move beyond moral economy as ethical critique, and we need to embrace foundational economy because the foundational economy can translate the values of the moral economy into the goods and services like health, education, dignified elder care, public food provisioning, all those goods and services that actually help to keep human beings flourishing beings. And this is why it's so important. And Andrew doesn't like this argument. I know that we've, we've heard it before. Uh, we've had it before in the sense that, that he maybe doesn't feel the need to move beyond moral economy, but I suspect he'll have something to say for himself about this, he usually does when I make this argument. So let me quickly fast forward, Michael, to the next slide. So bringing the argument up to date, uh, we hosted through a series of seminars at UCL, at Cardiff, a debate on the foundational economy. And Andrew offered, I think, the most novel contribution because he offered a, an ecological critique of foundational economy. He accepted the need for foundational economy, but he, he, he said it had a blind spot. It was very weak in terms of its ecological theorizing. And he, in his contribution, he drew on Ian Goff's marvelous book, Heat, Greed and Human Need, to propose um, a, a reconciliation between the social and the sustainability uh, dimensions. In this uh, eco-social perspective, Social policy needs to change, not just in incomes in terms of redistributing real income. It also needs to change real patterns of consumption. Why? Because some of the sectors that loom large in the foundational economy, like food and domestic energy, also have very high carbon footprints. And therefore, there was a need for a just transition, which is a theme, I think, Andrew would see it, and I think I see it, and I think we all see it. 
as a theme which is second to none in the academy and in the world today and in Glasgow as we speak in terms of COP26. And the key challenge, I think, in, ju in a just transition is how to build a bridge between the, the, the worlds of those who worry about the end of the earth and those who worry about getting to the end of the month. That is the key challenge for my money in terms of a just transition. And finally, Michael, you'll be glad to know. I want to thank Bev and all your colleagues, especially Michael Lambert, for allowing us to pay tribute to an exemplary post-disciplinary scholar today. But as well as being a scholar, Andrew's been a steadfast friend and mentor to me for more than 40 years. But speaking for myself, and as Bev said, for many, many, many others in and beyond the UK, I think what's most admirable about Andrew is that he embodies in his everyday life all the values that he extols in his work. Now, he's going to be hugely embarrassed to hear that, but as I say, so what? Thanks, Bev. Thank you, Kevin. That was absolutely wonderful, uh, especially including the holiday photographs. <laughs> I thought you'd like them, Bev. <laughs> I've never seen you in hair, Andrew. <laughs> so that, I think that was really, really nice. What I also should have said that you mentioned, Kevin, that's very important is that uh, Balihar has been editing a uh, Feshcrift book that's when will it be due for publication, Balihar? I know it's been in press for, for some time. Um, most likely February next year. February, so that's great. So that's perfect timing in a way as well. And, and that was wonderful because I think what it did, uh, Kevin, was to draw out a lot of Andrew's work. And again, how he's so engaged still with so many issues. You know, really, he should be at COP at the moment, but um, he's here and we're celebrating him. So thank you very, very much. And I think you're absolutely right. He does embody those values very importantly, especially especially with his, his, the people he mentees and his PhD students. And actually, Andrew, you're going to get more and more embarrassed as the day goes on. So yeah, as you say, so what? He'll sit with it. And that, that's the important thing to do in a fetch crypt. So now I'm going to move over to Diane Ray. Diane has also been a friend of Andrew's for some time and is also a major um, a major theorist who runs in parallel with Andrew again, coming from also different perspectives and kind of stretching a lot of the, the, the work that Andrew has done on Bourdieu and on education in particular. Uh, Diane is Professor of Education at Cambridge and has written some amazing books on education. And if you don't know about class and education, I suggest you follow her very quickly because the, the last one, miseducation, is, is really important. But my favourite was classwork. So I think also um, Diane and Andrew have been in engagement for some time. So I'll hand over to Diane now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bev. Um, I, I think this is going to be further embarrassment for you, Andrew, because it's very much a tribute rather than an interrogation. And my problem is basically that I agree with practically everything you've written. Um, although I've learned a great deal from all of Andrew's writing, I'm going to focus on the moral significance of class, which foregrounds the moral dimensions of class to examine both class contempt and class shame as structural effects of our increasingly unequal society. Andrew writes about the righteous indignation that accompanies a sense of injustice. And I hope my talk is in the, moral, in the spirit of the moral significance of class and reflects some of that righteous indignation. We certainly need as much righteous indignation as we can muster in these cruel and callous times. The story of class inequalities is a powerful moral tale, less dramatic and more poignant than the account of the corrupted and compromised values of the rich and powerful that Andrew recounts in Why We Can't Afford the Rich. It tells a very different story to that of the wealthy. In place of greed, competition and elitism, 
are shame, humiliation, despair and powerlessness. It speaks of exploitation and oppression and the willful neglect of the potential of huge swathes of English society. Just as the corrupt cronyism of the right wing affluent elite is a scandal, so too is the disregard and contempt for the working classes. And it's that story of class contempt, shame and disregard that we are told so powerfully in the moral significance of class. For me, the heart of the book lies in the powerful, evocative conceptualization of internal conversations of what Andrew calls mundane reflexivity and how these shape our normative commitments and emotional responses. In our current harsh and increasingly unequal world, it's become more and more important to give a louder voice to what Andrew calls internal conversations and longing that help us to make sense of the obvious point that one's relationship to the world is not simply one of accommodation or becoming skilled in its games, but at least in some way of wanting to be different and wanting the world and its games to be different. And throughout the book, Andrew makes a convincing case for the need for a strong moral compass in relation to class and its myriad largely unacknowledged discriminations. But also significant is the centrality given to emotions and the recognition that inequality and symbolic domination are experienced primarily emotionally. As Andrew asserts, the shaming of those who fail educationally is a structurally generated effect, even though it's felt as an individual failure. England's obsession with meritocracy and social mobility has masked deepening economic inequalities and their power to shape educational achievement. Instead, we've become the aspiration nation in which the prevalent belief is that anyone with enough determination, hard work and talent can be whatever they want to be. And as a consequence, the working classes have become the outcasts in this English aspirational dream story. And as such are regarded, are disregarded and often treated with contempt by the more privileged in society. And the moral significance of class powerfully reveals the emotional costs and pain of this disregard and contempt. And nowhere is this contempt more explicit than in the, in the regulations, rankings and assessments that permeate our educational system, sorting out the winners from the losers. Boris Johnson endorsed this sifting process in a speech where he argued, the harder you shake the pack, the easier it will be for some cornflakes to get to the top. This is the brutal form of meritocracy that sees the majority as an undifferentiated mass who will inevitably struggle in life because they lack the intelligence of those who are successful and rise to the top. The focus on intrinsic worth, intelligence, talent and effort ignores the biggest influence on who becomes successful, the wealth and power of parents. Johnson's words are a vivid example of the elitism, competitiveness and class superiority that drives policy in our state educational system. But when read through the insights of the moral significance of class, our attention is directed beyond policy implications to consider the emotional consequences for those most affected. Yet the impact on the self-worth and feelings of the working class children placed in bottom sets or segregated in predominantly working class schools is an issue that is still worryingly overlooked when policies of parental choice and setting and streaming are considered. In 2021, we have a toxic, hyper-competitive educational system premised on individual excellence a premise which demands mass failure for most of the working classes who are shunted into bottom sets 
routinely humiliated for the smallest incursions of excessive hard rules and regulations. And that if these incursions are deemed to be too frequent, isolated in behaviour hubs where they're not allowed to speak or move for hours at a time. And this is how academies like Brampton Manor in the East End of London, celebrated by Boris Johnson in his speech to the Tory party conference last month, can send more children to Oxbridge than Eton, namely through processes of ruthless selection that necessitate the public shaming and humiliation of working class children. But as the moral significance of class makes clear, this shaming and humiliation is fueled by class contempt. The book discusses cl class contempt in detail, arguing that it results in double standards whereby the same behaviour of people from different class backgrounds is evaluated differently. Judgments are made that are strongly class biased. Slights, dismissals and rejections are inevitable consequences of a pervasive upper and middle class sense of social, moral and intellectual superiority. But instead of a recognition of the social damage inflicted by such attitudes, we have a pervasive denial. Yet much research reveals many telling examples of upper and middle class contempt with both parents and their children talking dismissively about both the stupidity and the bad behaviour of working class children and young people. When it becomes clear that they have little contact with such children, Working class children neither attend their elite schools or are part of their social networks. Even when middle class parents send their children to the same schools as the working classes, often in place of an empathetic understanding, is the feeling that the working classes are a problem to be dealt with. And one of the things that I really liked about the moral significance of class was the piercing forensic lens that it directs at middle and upper class hypocrisy. The book also addresses the tension between recognition and redistribution, which is all too often positioned as an oppositional dynamic. And whilst Andrew acknowledges the importance of recognition to individuals and groups who may suffer from either a lack of recognition or indeed from systemic misrecognition, he highlights how prioritising recognition can prop up the neoliberal project by obscuring the need to address real inequalities. The moral significance of class establishing, establishes convincingly how inequalities inherent to the existence of class do real harm to people and as such cannot be remedied through verbal or symbolic recognition. And whilst accepting that recognition is often desired and therefore ought to be fought for, Andrew demonstrates convincingly that social class inequalities can only be addressed through redistribution. And as he concludes in the book, important though recognition undoubtedly is, there's a danger of focusing too much on recognition itself and not enough on what it is for. Regardless of 150 years of universal state education, the working classes continue to be positioned with our, within our education system as an unknowing, unreflexive, tasteless mass from which the middle classes draw their distinction. Even those middle classes who chil whose children attend socially mixed schools have complex and difficult feelings towards those working class others ranging from visceral distaste to more ambivalent but still defended responses. But far too rarely have questions of parental choice setting and streaming and incentive schemes in schools been regarded as ethical and moral concerns rather than simply issues of policy. But the question that the moral significance of class focuses our attention on is, is this morally acceptable. 
So drawing this to a conclusion, I, I want to say that Andrew's work shines a powerful forensic light on the dissembling, the awkward fumbling around the edges of class by making a very convincing case for the need for a strong moral compass in relation to class and its myriad largely unacknowledged discriminations. What Andrew succeeds in doing with clarity and conviction is to reveal how moral agency is at the very centre of class conflict. But another vital message that the moral significance of class illustrates as well is that class is as much about feelings and effective responses as it is about what we do. And the overarching both is a hugely important insight that inequality and its manifestations in the form of social class is always immoral and unacceptable. So thank you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Diane. That was an absolutely wonderful combination, both of you, Diane and Kevin, together of Andrew's extensive work that links issues of moral economy through class into very, very different domains. And so into the eco, into sustainability, and then also into class in education itself. And I think that book is, and I'm sure Balihar and Bob will go on to discuss this in Moral and Political Economies. That book is one of the most important books that I think has been written on class in terms of the sociological understanding of contempt and how it works. And we've just, ever since you wrote that book, I mean, we've just seen it extend. It's been amplified in so many different ways and also institutionalized in so many ways. So for once, people are ahead of their time. So I'm going to hand this over to Andrew now and ask him if he'd like to respond. If we have any questions from the audience, please put them in the question and answer session and we can get to those. So over to you, Andrew. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for coming. And thanks so much to Kevin and Diane for those talks. Um, yeah, I agree with everything they said, of course, but that's an, that's because I've learned from them both, you know, and adjusted my thinking appropriately. Um, so thank you both. I'm going to take Kevin first. Well, thanks for the memories, Kevin. Um, and yes, academic work is so much more fulfilling when it's cooperative and embedded in wider social life and friendships. And um, Kevin and I benefited from working in that pre-RAE period, also pre-neoliberalism, pre-online working, when academics could find time to have coffee, lunch and tea, and mix social talk with talk about their subjects. And we learned so much from each other through that, and it developed a sense of belonging, and which is so hard to, to get these days. And yes, universities in the 70s and 80s also had many bad features too, but many like Sussex where we were at allowed, and I, so I understand Lancaster in its early days, they allowed academics to be intellectually adventurous, encouraging interdisciplinarity and trusting academics to be guided by the love of their subjects, rather than the imperative of of hitting audit targets. And um, when I was doing those empirical projects with Kevin, I was also um, finishing off my first book on um, the philosophy of social science, method and social science. And I remember apologizing to Kevin and saying, um, I'm, I'm sorry, um, I've still got, I've, I've got to meet this deadline for the philosophy of social science book. And it seemed weird at the time to be moving back and forth between the philosophical and the substantive research. But now I realise, well, that's what I've been doing ever since, you know, and actually it's quite good. <laughs> so on our, in our work on high tech, um, we were concerned about the effects on regional development, but not at that time in the early 80s in relation to the future of humanity and the planet. And now we realise that some, that while some high tech can contribute to decarbonisation, much high tech provides limited employment, relies on planned obsolescence and creates enormous waste. And the foundational economy gets us 
away from the fetish of high tech. And I have to admit, when I first came across the idea of foundational like, economy, I liked its largely bottom up and eminently constructive and practical character. The way it combines meeting basic needs with empowering communities through social licensing, the way it supports diverse organizational forms and avoids predatory forms of finance and control. But initially, I didn't recognize its potential beyond isolated projects. But since then, what's gradually dawned on me was that the thinking behind the foundational economy movement is actually different from most radical political economy in a good way. And that, I think, is because it's prescriptive about the kind of use values that should be prioritized. Arguing we need to support and grow those sectors that meet basic needs such as care, food and housing. And by contrast, most radical po political economy focuses on exchange value and how much money different groups get out of the economic process. A focus which mirrors capitalism's own pursuit of money as its ultimate goal. And it seems a long time now, maybe a century since radical political economists have been critical of what is produced, perhaps because they have thought it's illiberal to tell people what they should and shouldn't consume. And wealth has often been seen in money, money terms. So we take the financial representation of wealth for wealth itself. And wealth is basically, economic wealth is use values. And the point of economic activity is provisioning. The use values provided by goods and services rather than the accumulation of money. And the foundational economy recognizes this. And while a Green New Deal is now the overriding imperative for the future of the planet, it's largely compatible with foundational economy. Green concerns also make us look at what we produce and consume. And the Green New Deal, it also prioritizes giving ordinary people a stake in greening the, the economy. And as unless you said, and, and unless, as you said, Kevin, so, so well, unless we bridge the gap between those who worry about the end of the planet and those who worry about the end of the month, it simply won't happen. And we didn't worry about balancing the books in 1945. We treated the emergency of the war as an emergency and switched resources into saving the country, producing what was needed for that time. And OK, some radical political economists have called for zero growth or degrowth, but we do also need to go beyond that and talk about what's important to retain and expand and what to shrink. So anyway, these are the kinds of things that Kevin and I have been discussing over the last 40 years, plus many, many more, of course. So turning now to uh, Diane and her comments, comments on education in relation to the moral significance of class. Well, that book for me was the result of a number of things coming together quite by accident. Reading Bourdieu and then Adam Smith on moral sentiments, Nancy Fraser on distribution and recognition, and Martha Nussbaum's work in philosophy on emotions. But it was also very much inspired by Diane's brilliant research on inequality and education, and that of Bev Skeggs on class and gender too. So whereas philosophers discuss emotions and moral sentiments in abstraction from social structures of inequality, Diane's and Bev's work, their work vividly reflects the effects of living in a highly unequal society including the impact on feelings of self-worth and moral sentiments such as resentment of injustice you know Alice is Alice illustrated in the view from the bottom set that uh, Diane discusses and as Margaret Archer said our emotions are a bodily commentary on our well-being and that of the things we care about and socialization is not entirely or wholly subconscious we register a lot of what goes on its pains, its humiliations, its offences, and its pleasures and satisfactions. And in these internal conversations, maybe sometimes what's implicit is at least, how do I feel about such and such? How should I feel? How am I being treated? Is that fair? Is it respectful? And research like Diane's shows how emotions, particularly regarding our relations to others, provide discerning commentaries on our well-being revealing a lot about our situation, our experience and our treatment. And yes, they are influenced by dominant discourses too. And feelings are often mixed and 
people's response is complex and confused, but that's often because of the tensions between different pressures, many of them created by inequalities that pull in different directions. And in this context, I remember Diane's work with colleagues, with her colleagues on the intersections between class, race and gender in schools and reading about white middle class liberal parents who decide to send their kids to racially diverse schools for a mix of reasons, some to do with support for multiculturalism, some to do with giving their own kids an advantage, but coupled with certain anxieties regarding which others their own kids should mix with according to their race and class. And as an illustration of the complexity of the moral significance of class is very striking. But behind it are all the intersecting inequalities which present people with unequal opportunities and oppose the self-interest of the advantaged to the general interest. And as Diane said, the links between recognition and distribution are crucial. If we just focus on recognition, it, it appears that things would change radically if only the middle and upper classes were nicer and more respectful to the working class. But you know, if income and wealth are highly unequally distributed, if the quality of jobs is highly unequal in terms of pay and skill and security, then that will guarantee that what individuals achieve through their work will be highly unequal. And they will then appear to deserve unequal recognition. So every time an organization creates jobs of highly unequal quality and pay, it reproduces class by creating opportunities that are unequal. No wonder unequal, no wonder equal opportunities usually fail to mention class. Declarations of equal recognition are easy. Every child matters, blah, blah. But it, unless that's backed up materially through equal treatment and equal provision, it's worthless. And uh, I have heard Diane talk about um, the experience in Finland, OK, a more equal country, but where there's a very de determined effort to equalize school provision across the board with very ben beneficial effects. And um, it makes me think of um, what Diane was saying, makes me think of something the, the American philosopher Elizabeth Anderson said, that a nice analogy for showing the absurdity of notions of social mobility and meritocracy. She says it's, it's like explaining the outcome of a game of musical care, chairs by saying that those left standing at the end didn't try hard enough and need to aspire more as if the structure of the game had nothing to do with it. And the fallacy of composition, that what is possible for a few people at a particular time in terms of upward social mobility must therefore be possible for all people simultaneously is central to the dominant official line on inequality or rather social mobility. And sadly, a lot of people swallow that. And finally, I, I know some people find my focus on morality strange, perhaps because they associate morality with, re with repressive norms that limit what people can do. But being against repressive norms is itself a moral position. And the point of morality and ethics is to enable us to live together justly and to flourish. And of course, in practice, um, actually existing moralities and ethics may fail to do that and moral sentiments may be corrupted by inequalities, so we have double standards, as Diane said. But one can also speak morality to power. And without morality or ethics and some conception of what's necessary for well-being, there'd be little reason for objecting to anything as unfair or oppressive. And without ethics, politics and social scientific critiques are directionless. So that's all agreements, I think, <laughs> with um, Kevin and Diane, but I'll leave that there. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank you very much, Andrew, and obviously Diane and Kevin. D Diane and Kevin, we do have time if you want to come back to say anything else uh, to Andrew or ask him a question. I'm quite intrigued by uh, if you did micro circuits of capital now, uh, what you'd find. <laughs> Both of you. Well, 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 very quickly, uh, uh, Bev, uh, a student said to me uh, uh, some time ago, you started your career with high tech and you ended it with low tech. And I said, well, it, it might appear that way, but the foundational economy can be a very, very intense user of technology. 
it may not be generating it in the high top tech plants of Silicon Valley or Southeast England, but education, health, dignified elder care are could be incredibly intensive users and will be in a, in a, in a more equal uh, society, it, it seems to me. But what, what Diane and Andrew have been saying about what I'd call mo moral sentiments, going back to Adam Smith, uh, was brought home to me in our work, uh, work that I've done more recently on food. And I, I've never seen uh, shame so tangible as when I've spoken to people who can't feed their children. And to see people coming out of food banks with bags that have that have been given to them by waitros so that it puts some sugar on the pill and hides the fact that they've been in receipt of free food. I've never encountered that kind of shame from people. So yes, a high tech is one thing, as Andrew says, but um, foundational services sh that, that, that provide a material basis for respect and equality, as Diane was saying earlier, is also critically important, it seems to me. Sorry for going on, Diane. Diane, what, what, what do you think in terms of, yeah, are they critical? Well, I, I think that, um, I mean, the moral significance of PLAS was really, really key and timely when it was written, but it's even more vital and timely now. We um, English school children are the most unhappy in the world. When you ask um, English school children and young people um, whether they feel more happy or sad at school, something like over 70% of them say they feel sad. Um, and then when you unpick that, it's it's about the the the, the fact that they, they feel they're being treated as um, unimportant, inferior, insignificant. Um, and and I, I, I'm glad that um, Andrew brought up Finland because Finland has what is seen as, as, as the second best educational system in the world. It's been outstripped by Estonia. But the, the most significant thing about those two countries is they are the two countries that are doing the most to reduce social class inequalities across the country, uh, as opposed to here, where we're just letting it increase by leaps and bounds. Um, and it's that moral ethical vacuum. You know, I, th I think you're going to have to write an updated version, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's interesting, Diane, because I was going to ask Andrew at the end, what's he going to write next? Uh, and maybe we can we can slip this in now because it's like, what do you think out of all the books that you've written, Andrew, is the most important? And what do you think really, you know, speaks to what's happening now? Um, Josh, <laughs> well, I think the last two. Um, the one which mm -hmm. I felt I put most into was um, why things matter to people. Um, and um, the, the Rich book yeah. was rather hastily done, a bit rough and ready. Um, but I, I came up with the title first. And I thought I got to run with this. <laughs> so, but um, I now think if I, if I can find time and motivation to do more, one of the main things will be to do with moral economy and rethinking our economics from the bottom up and that it's about provisioning it's about what is economic evaluation and we're forced to evaluate things in money terms because we need money to buy stuff but that's not the only way you evaluate what you need you know within a household if there are the members of the household they you share things you do things you provision for each other without money intervening, at least one hopes. Um, so it's about that, but I'm torn as well because um, that also seems rather abstract and academic at a time when 
things are absolutely desperate you know, for the planet. But the, yeah, I, 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 I tend to work best on my, my digressions. The moral significance of class was a digression from a book which was going to be on moral economy. And so was the book on the rich, although that is really about moral economy. And I thought I would one day actually get to write a, an academic book on moral economy. But um, I find it hard to work when it's not raining, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you are retired. <laughs> you don't yes. have to keep writing. Exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I, it, was, it was just a question because it's almost as if you keep engaging and you, you're a bit like a dog with a bone, as in you keep going back to the moral economy and you keep applying it in different ways. Uh, and you can see that in your early work. So th there's a lot going on there. And that's why I wondered if you were thinking about developing it uh, in any way. But I, I can fire another question at you since like we've got uh, a couple of a couple more minutes, if that's OK, because we weren't we didn't have enough time to organise a panel on your your methodology uh, approach on the way you've written a lot about method, critical realism, uh, and I know Bob's going to touch on that um, slightly in, in his approach. But I always hear in your work over the years, kind of there's Marxist theory, and it's interesting you were just talking about use value and exchange value. Uh, but the, then there's always a kind of more moral philosophy so kind of not a Marxist approach to uh, inequality, more of a philosophical approach. Now, obviously, Marx did both uh, economy and philosophy, but I wondered how you describe your approach in putting those different theoretical frameworks together. Um, yeah, well, I was going to say later on, it's okay. <laughs> partly a result of accidents, you know, I got into Marx when a lot of people were getting into it um, when I was doing my PhD in the early 70s. And um, I ended up also teaching, um, having to teach an interdisciplinary course on founders of social science, where you had to choose choose three founders. And I chose Marx, Mill and Smith. And they proved to be tremendously helpful throughout, you know, ever since whenever it was 1988 or whenever I was doing that. And um, and Marx, there was a, there was a, a big literature one on one at one stage on Marx and ethics, and he has a troubled relationship to ethics. But he's he does occasionally saying certain things are immoral, you know. And um, Smith was a uh, was amazing. I mean, he's so so misunderstood, so misrepresented by both the right and the left as a one eyed. Um, apologists for for self-interest and se selfishness, in fact, and not at all if you actually read carefully what he's he's, he's written. Um, but that was a very engaging way of thinking about um, the actual experience of living with inequality. Um, and accidentally, that was reinforced by reading. Um, Martha Nussbaum, a neo-Aristotelian philosopher, um, who I got into, I think, probably as a result of being of talking to a philosopher at Sussex, John O'Neill, who then came to Lancaster at the same time as me and is now in Manchester. And he's very into Aristotle and wrote a wonderful book on the markets. And that, that also got me into thinking about economic evaluation. What's important? We live, you know, capitalism is a system of unpaid costs, unpaid in environmental costs, unpaid social costs. And you know, we're prisoners of money as a, as a system of valuation, um, but we also have to break with that. And actually we can, you know, we're not actually limited by the budget. We have our own currency. <laughs> you know, we're, we're limited by res real resources, especially labor. And in, in, in wartime, they actually stop certain activities to concentrate other active on other activities. You know, and we could at the extreme do that, but probably that won't happen. Um, but we do have to think of eco eco economics as provisioning for our well-being and that of the planet. And then 
decide what to do, you know, as, as it were, rather than thinking, um, what can we afford or and so on. Yeah, so you're kind of uh, agreeing with Kevin's point about, and I think it's kind of a lot of the feminist critique of social reproduction and care is that you actually work out what do people need in order to flourish and survive. And I mean, you write a lot about flourishing. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's quite significant. Uh, if I can push you just a tiny bit more, uh, and that's that's almost on, uh, and I think again other people are going to talk about your interdisciplinarity. Was that uh, a conscious decision because you began as a geographer, or was it just that you found interesting people that you wanted to have dialogue with? Um, mainly the latter, and may and also because as I was going to say later. Um, at Sussex, it, in its early years, it had this wonderful mission, and well, they didn't call it a mission, that's more recent, isn't it, of uh, redrawing the map of learning. And they actually obliged everyone to do that because um, every student and every lecturer had to spend half their time on a, on a discipline year and half their time teaching and, or doing interdisciplinary courses. And um, and there were no departments. And even on the geography courses that I that I taught, a lot of the references on the reading list would be from non geographers, but nobody worried. And as Kevin will attest, it was a fantastic time to be stimulating time. And um, even though the teaching loads were heavy, um, it, it was you could write more quickly because you could talk to people who'd already done a bit of work on some subject and could tell you, well, that's not worth looking at, this is. And um, you learn more quickly as a result. And you're not worrying about the RE. It's just, you know, you could just follow what appeals to you and what matters. You know. So you apply your values to your own personal life. What matters? OK, well, on, on that point, we'll give you a break now, Andrew. <laughs> so thank you so much to Kevin. And you really should look out for the foundational economy work. It is a really important challenge to how we organise our lives and what actually matters. And obviously to Diane's work on education. Uh, they really and uh, they really do engage with Andrew and it's it's really important. So we'll have a break now and we'll come back at 3.15 uh, when we'll have Balihar and Bob Jessup and they will be talking more about moral and political economy. So thank you very much. See you soon.
Hello, how is that? I'm just putting some stuff in my eyes. Is that all right, Andrew? It's just we had some extra time, so I thought I'd ask you some questions. Just uh, as a thing, Bev. Yeah. You can, everyone can hear you, but only I can, or well, everyone in the speakers can see you. So, <laughs> I've just been, uh, there was a brief technical thing earlier on when some of the uh, the slides didn't come on from Kevin's bit, so I've just been putting those uh, uh, back through for some uh, some people. I, I think it's a national proprietary thing again, but um, hopefully those will be visible to people. I just had a quick run through on uh, now, yeah, just to make sure they're all working, so. Yeah, can we put them up on the Casey page? Do you think, could we ask? You know me, I'm a historian of the recent past. Holiday snaps from the 80s, it's, that's gold. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'll have to get your permission and Kevin's first, Andrew, but. <laughs> what do you think, Andrew? Do you, oh. do you fancy having your holiday snaps on our website? It, well, it, strictly speaking, as Kevin said, it was a, a conference. <laughs> um, it lasted five days. And um, these were convened by Kostis Hadjimikalis and da Dean of Ayu. And um, they were held every two second years on various Greek islands. Wow. Funded by the government. And it was mainly about uneven development in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so we'd work from nine o'clock till about three o'clock uh, for five days running, but go down to the beach afterwards and then the taverna. Oh, that's my kind of life. <laughs> <laughs> so. Well, at least it stopped raining. So back to your writing, Andrew. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's when it's raining that uh, I sometimes resort to writing. You know. That's what I mean. Oh, sorry. No, it's it's just sorry. I meant it's just started just a little here. I can see it. All right. Uh, yeah, might be the same there. Sometimes it doesn't get as far as Lancaster. So, Michael, uh, can we get Bob live? Camera wise, no, that's an ongoing technical thing, but he's just messaged me to say he's going to run through. Still, his mic still works, so he's going to run through with his mic and I'll just go through with his slides. And as I've just run through with uh, Kevin's back again, uh, I should be able to get those up on my other bit for uh, his slides to talk over. So the audience should be able to see those okay. and then he just run through them. OK. I don't know if you saw in the, I mean, maybe it's to, to share in the, the next session, but a number of people posted comments and questions just after the final bit uh, finished. And you've got a, a few here from, uh, from Christina Polkloff uh, says, greeting Andrew and everyone. Uh, geography, it's interdisciplinarity and focus on space and place. It seems to be going out of fashion in many European countries. And he says, sorry, she says, uh, how could it receive new life in the digitalized world of work? And then there's another comment just just says love Andrew by uh, Chris Platina Fung from Melbourne, Australia, which I think the time difference between now and there is uh, he's certainly committed. <laughs> wow. That's great. What I was going to do was I guess most people have seen oh, my eyes are funny. Most people have seen. Uh, the programme. I was going to list your books in the chat as well. Just in I, case people. Can I put, yeah, can I put things, sorry, in the questions and answers? You should be able to, but if not, I can just drop those in. That's in there. I did put a, a brief link in the Eventbrite bit to all the publishers' information yeah. for, the, for the more recent ones, anyway. I just thought I'd put those in so when we refer to them, people will know what they are. Perfect, that's come through there. OK, so that's good. What does it feel like so far, Andrew? Remembering everybody can hear you. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> so far. Uh, 
these things are always worse in anticipation. Yeah, definitely. Enjoy it. Yeah. Take the mic on more than anybody. <laughs> Just trying to get everything to work. From one Hi, mind, it's, uh, going well. <laughs> Great to see you guys, honestly. It's been a long time. I haven't been at Lancaster for ages. I know, it's a hell of a long time. I don't think it's like we've stopped moving around, haven't we, really? <laughs> well, you were in the uh, uh, Goldsmith, no? And then LSC, weren't you, Deb? I was, I was, yeah. And, and I mean, I, I partly never wish I'd ever left Goldsmiths, but in terms of what's happening to it now. <laughs> I'm very pleased I'm at Lancaster, very, very pleased. And it's it's lovely to be back with old friends. Um, but I think I had a special affinity to Goldsmiths. Oh. Um, and I didn't realise until I'd left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that sort of thing where you take things for granted, like the students and where it is. Oh, yes. And again, the interdisciplinarity was absolutely so important. Because, um, you know, people were just, yeah, having amazing conversations all the time. It got yeah. exhausting. Uh, yeah. But yeah, it's so tragic what's happening to Goldsmiths at the moment. You know, they're bringing in the banks to do the loans, um, getting rid of people, but doing it in the worst possible way. Well, not, not that you can yeah. do it, but you know, in the most horrific kind of menacing ways, I'd say. It, it's just awful to watch, really, really awful. Yeah, we've been going through the same thing here at uh, at Kent. Have you? I didn't know that. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. We we had we, have, we had a considerable deficit, and the banks effectively told us that they had to get rid of so many staff, um, redundancies, uh, well, voluntary severance and all that. But, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, no, it, wasn't, it wasn't it wasn't pleasant at all, and uh, I mean we, we tried to organise some sort of protest, but sadly it didn't really really work out. Right, well Goldsmiths have been, as they always do, they have the best art protests ever, you know, so they did a lot of doggy protests this time because they knew that social media, dogs and kittens get lots of... Oh, yes. uh, so. No, no, the protests have been good, but oh, it's it's just horrible to see that the it's cruel. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, no, yeah, it, yeah. You know, and it's actually losing what was so good about that education. It, it really is tragic, actually. Sorry so to uh, interrupt on one. It's a fairly serious subject. Uh, and, you know, I think that that further conversation needs to be had. <laughs> going going back live. Level, but we're going back for part two now. OK. Am I live? Floor is yours, Beth. Yes. Welcome back, everybody, to Andrew Sayers' Special Crypt. So we've just heard uh, Kerry Morgan and Diane Ray talking about class, place and inequality. Now we're going to move on to moral and political economies. The other major substantial uh, part of Andrew's oeuvre. Um, and we're going to begin with Dr. Balihar Sankara from uh, Kent, who's a senior lecturer in sociology and was a PhD student of Andrew's, I believe. <laughs> was actually at Lancaster with exceedingly long hair, I remember, <laughs> many years ago. Uh, and so is also writing uh, and editing, putting together the Feshgriff book for on Andrew's work, which so will come out in probably February. Uh, and Balihar works a lot on very similar issues in terms of philosophy, uh, in terms of really excellent articles on charities that I particularly like. Um, and so again, it is in real engagement with Andrew's theories. And then next will be Professor Bob Jessup from the department. Uh, Bob, who's written many, many Marxist theory books, uh, but who is probably most famous for his um, 
very different ways of understanding state regulation, governance and uh, cultural political economy. So we'll also engage with Andrew and has been working with him for a long time. So Balihar, over to you. Oh, thanks. Uh, I'm just going to share my, my slides here. I uh, take up. There you go. Can you uh, see it? OK, great. I'm just going to then just see if this goes. Oops. Uh, here. Does it go down? Is that, is that good to the next slide? That's perfect. Yeah, OK, great. Thanks. OK. Um, so, but first, um, just to say uh, my thanks to Bev uh, and Lancaster for the invitation. Um, I'm really delighted to participate in this event to honour Andrew's work. Um, and as Bev mentioned, um, uh, Gideon Calder at Swansea and I are organising a written festschrift, and it's been a real privilege for us to do this. And it uh, attests really to what already has been said about Andrew's work and, and the kind of person he is, uh, that we've got uh, um, many uh, contributors who, who, who've who just uh, shown so much attention to his work and attest to uh, the friendship that they have built with him over the years. Um, I was one of Andrew's first PhDs at Lancaster and the relationship between the supervisor and a student is a very special and dear one. And I want to thank here Andrew for being such a great role model for me. What stands out for me during my time at Lancaster was not merely Andrew's razor sharp analysis and insight, but his patience, generosity and his sense of fairness. He particularly disliked the powerful and the privileged. And this came across quite clearly in class and research seminars. After I left Lancaster, I continued to follow Andrew's work, in particular his writing on moral economy, which came to shape my own research on Central Asia, as well as looking at charitable giving and philanthropy in this country. Which then kind of brings me to the topic of this presentation of moral economy. Um, can you see the next slide? Yeah, great, thanks. Yeah. So here I will just briefly look at the impact of Andrew's moral economy framework. Andrew's view of moral economy has proven to be very attractive and productive. Here's a list of substantive areas in which scholars have drawn on its framework. It has been used to critically analyze and evaluate the nature of contemporary capitalism, in particular, the Rontier activities of the rich and powerful. This was the topic of his critically acclaimed book, Why We Can't Afford the Rich. Some scholars have drawn on Andrew's framework to examine social interactions and relations within the digital economy. Dave Aldevas's book, Profit, Gift in a Digital Economy, is an excellent example of this. In my writings on the voluntary and charitable sector, I drew on Andrew's ideas on lay morality and contributive justice to explore the dynamics of class, gender and morality within the third sector. Some of my colleagues have employed Andrew's work to analyse the processes of neoliberalisation in developing and post-Soviet economies. For example, Georg Wiergratz at Leeds has investigated the nature of money making and corruption in Western Africa, which he turned into a brilliant book entitled The Neoliberal Moral Economy. My research with Almira Satavadeva examined the nature of moral production, so uh, the, the nature of economic production and development in Central Asia, which experienced a shift from a command economy to a market economy after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Our book, uh, Volunteer Capitalism and its Discontent, explored the harmful effects of a neoliberal regime of property rights, a system which benefited the powerful property class over the property lust class, a system which was morally legitimized with reference to the rule of law, 
the sanctity of contract, keeping one's promises, the market as a place of choice, equality and freedom, and overlaying all that, a powerful moral discourse around the free market, the neoliberal variant, free of government intervention rather than free of rent. So what is the moral economy uh, and why has it been used by so many? Well, uh, the moral economy perspective is a critical study of ethical character of, of economic relations and institutions. At the basic level, it examines the influence of morality on economic behaviour and how economic pressures and forces can compromise, override and reinforce moral dimensions of social life. As a mode of inquiry, it interrogates how moral sentiments, norms, rules and power relations constitute economic practices. It assesses whether moral justifications for economic activities are reasonable or not. For instance, Andrew challenges the moral justification for income based on mere ownership of scarce assets. He regards such income as unearned and undeserved. It also involves a critical an ethical critique of economic practices and institutions. It evaluates the consequences on people's well-being and the environment. As Andrew notes, in recognising how economic activities affect human flourishing, social analysis cannot avoid normative implications. This aspect of its work is particularly attractive to scholars who seek not merely to describe the world as it is, but to say how the world ought to be, one in which there's less, less social suffering and greater equality for all. There are many reasons why Andrew's framework appeals to scholars, and I would suggest some of them here. His critique of economic activities is derived from a standpoint of a qualified ethical naturalism, a largely near Aristotelian stance. Evaluative judgments are not subjective opinions in which anything goes and are reason free, but relate to objective conditions and situations, in particular human needs and capacity for flourishing and suffering. It is a post-disciplinary mode of inquiry, drawing on a range of disciplinary perspectives from classical political economy, sociology, institutional economics, to ethics, philosophy and political theory. Moral economy is also an object of this inquiry, insofar as all economic activities depend on moral sentiments, norms and rules. As he says, all economies are moral economies, both market and non-market, capitalist and non-capitalist variants. This viewpoint is in sharp contrast to the writings of E.P. Thompson and James Scott, who tend to reserve the term moral economy for pre-capitalist societies. In comparison to the usual treatment of moral economy, Andrew's view is broader and more inclusive. The focus is beyond market coordination to the dominance of exchange value over use value and the damaging effects of quantification of things, especially money and land. It is more inclusive in that his analysis and critique extend to non-market forms of provisioning and tackle a range of normative questions from equality and distribution to contribution, care and human capabilities. So summing up, what is appealing about Andrew's framework is that it offers a critical way to understand and evaluate economic activities and overcome disciplinary boundaries 
and common dualism, such as fact value, mind body theory practice, that tend to dominate social science. But there is one aspect of his work I wish Andrew had written more, and that's resistance. So, whereas E.P. Thompson, James Scott, and Carl Pernani examine acts of resistance to marketization, commodification, and capitalism, think of their works on the food riots, hidden forms of resistance, and the double movement. Andrew tends to say very little about political resistance. Like Bourdieu, Andrew argues that acquiescence and resignation to economic domination are more likely than resistance and protest. He rightly refuses to over romanticize resistance, recognizing that people can accept, accommodate, and normalize economic injustices rather than to resist and revolt against them. Though this position sits uneasily with his stance of qualified ethical naturalism and the importance of emotional responses to suffering and lack of flourishing. After all, people are likely to feel resentful and angry about injustices and harms. As he notes in criticizing Bourdieu's concept of habitus, people do not accommodate indifferently to prevailing situations. They are likely to feel good or bad about them in various ways. They do not adjust to contempt and exploitation as easily as they do to respect. This is not to say that Andrew hasn't written on resistance. He has. In particular, he has explored the mixed results and cost of resistance. He has examined how long and difficult periods of resistance can take a toil on activists, what Lisa Tesman has called the burden virtues. Given that Andrew notes that people are socially, economically, and psychologically dependent on others for their well being, what are the political implications of an economic system that leaves a vast majority of people lacking basic needs or suffering for want of public goods? It is not a situation that people can accept for a long period of time without demanding social change or calling on the state and corporation to change the nature of economic and social responsibilities and with it the division of labour so as to alleviate social suffering and harms. Part of me agrees with Andrew that subordinate groups are unlikely to turn their emotional resistance into political resistance. There is plenty of evidence showing how disadvantaged and marginalised groups accept and normalise existing unfair and unjust relations, and even take pride in enduring harsh economic conditions. In our work on Central Asia, Almira and I found social class divisions and state bias towards capitalist interests were key in dampening and repressing political and economic protests. But there is also evidence that people do demand change, though they may not be able to immediately or clearly articulate what kind of change they want. Again, Almira and I were surprised at the level of grassroots resistance against usury, excessive rent, and exploitative working conditions in Central Asia. While the level of political resistance was uneven and variable, it was clear that poor and disadvantaged groups were not completely resigned to the process of neoliberal commodification in the region. While the nature of resistance is a matter of empirical investigation, it seems to be important to understand the moral economy, both as it is, but also how it ought to be. I think Andrew's writing can offer ways of incorporating resistance into the moral framework moral economy framework. So I want to end by first thanking Andrew for offering us such a fruitful way of thinking about economies, 
but also to ask him to say more about emotional and critical resistance so that we can further benefit from his work. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much, Paleha. That's, that's definitely a question that Andrew will come to, I hope, in his response and a really good question too. So now we'll go over to Bob. Now, Bob, I believe you haven't got your camera working. Is that right? But we have your slides. Bob, are you there? Got to unmute. Now you can hear me. Great. Now, we've got your slides. Yes, very good. We'll go through the slides and part of the topic that I was talking about has already been well covered by Bala. So this is my comments on Andrew's contributions to post-disciplinary critical realism and moral economy. Next slide, please. Thank you. And I'm going to be dealing firstly with what we mean by post-disciplinarity. We've also heard about this from Kevin and from Bala, and I'm going to say this, the importance of post-disciplinarity also in terms of the context at Sussex and the context at uh, Lancaster. And they've been dealing with critical realism, which is what my interest in Andrew's work began with, his book on method in social science, which is now in its revised second edition. I'll then be talking about critical cultural political economy, which he elaborated with Larry Ray, who's now at Kent, but who was a fellow a lecturer here in Lancaster. Then I'll be some brief comments on moral economy, slightly different from those of Ballard, and then I'll reach my conclusions. So next slide is on post-disciplinarity. And I think that post-disciplinarity, Andrew's already described in terms of its context at Sussex University, which was committed to open studies and Lancaster uh, was committed to independent studies and in the same way, tried to not teach disciplines, but taught uh, fields and subjects. And when I came to Lancaster in 1990, I was one of the few people in the sociology department who had a first degree in sociology. Most people had degrees in other subjects, but I think that Andrew gave sociology its identity. When he was interviewed for his lectureship in 1993, he was asked why, as he, a geographer, he wanted to join sociology. And I saw that as a deliberate put down question. What on earth, do we, why would you want to join a sociology department? And he gave the perfect answer. And he regarded himself as a post-disciplinary theorist and he regarded sociology as a post-disciplinary department. It was an obvious choice for him to join. And I think that was one of the clinching factors that led him to be appointed. Previously, sociology had seen itself as a multi or transdisciplinary department, and people welcomed this new description, and it became a key part of our identity. And we now describe ourselves as a post-disciplinary department committed to public sociology. And I think if public sociology hadn't been invented by Michael Burroway, public sociology is also a commitment that Andrew would want to inscribe as part of his own identity. And I think that um, when we think of post-disciplinarity, many people in the department will obviously think of Andrew's work in geography, but as he said himself, it wasn't just geography. He taught half the subjects he was teaching, and it was a very intense teaching load at Sussex in other subjects. So we'll have the next slide now. And this is critical realism, which is a general philosophy of natural and social sciences, which plays an underlabouring role. That's the way in which it was described by Ray Bascar. Although I think that Andrew may comment also on the influence of Ram Hare, who was at Sussex, on the development of critical realism. What it does is distinguish a trans stratified intransitive world, which comprises the real the actual and the empirical. 
The intransitive world is the world that exists independently of its observation. And the transitive world is the world that is produced in and through observation and social sciences. And in general terms, critical realism contrasts the real, which comprises tendencies and counter tendencies, real mechanisms and uh, so forth. The actual, which is the actualization of these particular tendencies and counter tendencies in particular conditions and the empirical, which concerns the evidence that we have about the existence of the actual. Critical realism affirms the social world's open nature and how different domains interweave in its problems. So there's no fixed determinism in a critical realist view of the natural world or of the social world. And it needs that it's very difficult to explain the social world or the natural world in terms of pre-given laws which are automatic, predetermined, and realize themselves in terms of a regular relationship between cause and effect. And this means that critical realism is also sensitive to the provisional and incomplete nature of explanations. The open nature of the social world and of the natural world means that it is very difficult for us to predetermine what is bound to happen. And in this sense, critical realism asks what must the world be like for the actual or X to be actualized, for it to be uh, this is a form of retroduction rather than induction or deduction. And I'd like to comment quickly on those general principles of critical realism before I comment on critical realism in particular as it's developed by Andrew. And that's the underlaboring role of critical realism. In other words, critical realism doesn't give us any of the answers to real world problems. It distinguishes between the real, the actual and the empirical. And we have heard already how Andrew is always very concerned, not merely with the theoretical, but also with the empirical and how he engages with the real world in terms of the evidence that exists, for example, for human flourishing or not, for the existence of wealth inequalities or not and so forth. And it's also important to emphasize how Andrew asks questions about the real world. What must the real world be like for this existence, this lack of flourishing, this inequalities and so forth to be realized? Uh, next slide, please. Andrew Sayer is not just a critical realist in general, but he's a critical realist in particular. His most two most cited books are Method in Social Science, a realist approach, which he was writing when he was doing micro circuits of capital with Kevin in 1984, rewritten in 1982, just before he came to Lancaster. And there's a third revised edition in 2010. And the second most cited book is Realism and Social Science. And he's made, as Ballard pointed out, critical realist analyses of class, ethical philosophy, moral economy, cultural political economy, the wealthy, and so on. And this is an illustration of the post-disciplinary nature of his concerns. Andrew doesn't feel himself identified with a particular discipline, but traces real world problems in terms of their actuality and in terms of the evidence. Andrew argues that critical realism of philosophy, the focus is mainly on ontology, not on epistemology, and it is anti-foundationalist. In other words, it rejects the idea that there are predetermined bases for understanding the real world. And I think there may be a difference between him and me that I tend to adopt by default a Marxist position, but my Marxist position is one that is not economically determinist, but concerned with the analysis of social forms and the ways in which the capitalist economy's laws and tendencies are realized in particular empirical, actual 
conditions. And although Andrew says that critical realism focuses mainly on ontology, not epistemology, his work is very much concerned with the methods of social science and the ways in which one can explore the character of the, the actual in terms of its underlying disciplines. What he says is that realists seek to identify both necessity, naturally necessary properties and possibility in the world. What things must go together and what could happen given the nature of objects. With its focus on necessity and contingency rather than regularity, on open rather than closed systems, on how causal processes could produce quite different results in different contexts, we can see that Andrew's particular critical realism applied to particular contexts and particular problems is always open in terms of its con concern with what I call contingently necessary regularities. There's no necessity, there's no pure contingency. How ne naturally necessary properties interact and interweave is contingent but determined by the ways in which that interweaving occurs in open systems. Next slide, please. So what we can say about the open nature of critical realism as developed by Andrew is that critical realism supports a wide range of research methods, but the choice of research methods depends on the object of study on one's learning goals. You can have a different object of study and you can also have different questions you want to ask about it. And I think that's the importance of the moral economy that Andrew's learning goals when he looks at a particular object of study are also moral and normative. And he says there are four barriers to determinism. In other words, this is the anti-foundational nature of his critical realism, where the causal powers such as the ability to bear children exist depends on the contingent presence of certain structures or objects. In other words, we cannot assume that people have particular capacities. Whether these powers are ever exercised is contingent, not predetermined. If and when they're ever exercised, their consequences would depend on mediation or neutralization by other contingently related phenomena. And that's a key part of critical realism, the concern with tendencies and counter tendencies on how they interact. And natural and social causal powers themselves are not only their contingent exercise can be changed. So this is again a question of, as Balar pointed out, questions of how we resist natural and social causal powers and have the capacities to intervene to change them. The relationship between causal powers or mechanisms and their effects is therefore not fixed but contingent. Indeed, causal powers exist independently of their effects unless they derive from social structures whose reproduction depends on particular effects resulting. And I think this is um, Andrew's critical realism in particular has been there for a long time, but his reading of Bourdieu reinforces the fact that social structures are reproduced through hexis and habitus, and only if social structures are reproduced do their causal powers reproduce in turn. Next slide, please. Andrew and I both started working on cultural political economy at more or less the same time. And I think he was slightly in front of me with his work with Larry Ray on critical cultural political economy. And it says critical cultural political economy must be critical of its object, which requires four, ta four tasks. Sometimes the cultural turn inverts economic reductionism's dismissive treatment of culture and the life world. And it but it must do that by avoiding reducing economic systems to the life world that embeds them. So this is also, if you like, a Polanyan perspective as well, looking at the embedding and disembedding of the economy and the consequences of that. 
we must explore not only the social and cultural embedding of economic activities, but on how system mechanisms of capital accumulation and uneven development have powerful disembedding and disruptive effects. And that crucially is the, a, a key aspect of Andrew's critique of moral economy. It must reconsider classical political economy, which was always cultural and is still relevant today. And indeed, we can trace that back to Andrew's interest in Aristotle and the Aristotelian tradition. CCPE should include and develop some older views on economy and society, returning to the classical political economy 18th and 19th centuries, including therefore uh, Adam Smith and the, uh, his work on moral sentiments as well as the wealth of nations. And the relative importance of economy and culture is always an empirical question that depends on particular cases. So again, critical cultural political economy as developed by Andrew is not determinist, not foundational, but opens up a whole series of questions. Next slide, please. This is a slide that is concerned with what Bala has pointed out, which is moral economy. And Andrew says that moral economy can hardly avoid normative implications in dealing with matters of needs, flourishing and suffering. And I think it's important to emphasize here that those of us brought up in a Weberian tradition who've been told to separate norms and values and science can learn a lot from Andrew's rejection of that Weberian distinction and his endorsement of the inherently moral nature of economic activity. What he does is to study the constitutive moral norms and sentiments that structure and influence economic practices, both formal and informal, including their impact on flourishing and suffering, and how these are reinforced, compromised or overridden by economic pressures. And he says how people evaluate things and decide what matters and why requires engaging with elements such as moral sentiments, capacity for fellow, fellow feeling, virtues and vices, norms and moral reflection and argumentation in their relation to our sense of harm and flourishing. And I think we can say that in, in taking up moral economy, Andrew is committing himself to a concern with the conditions for human flourishing and uh, suffering and has his has therefore a top not a top down perspective but a bottom up perspective the last slide please and this is the conclusions as a post disciplinary theorist andrew combines insights and concepts from many disciplines but he creates his own distinctive philosophy of social science linking to concepts of well-being that are alien to much modern social science. He's a careful reader of philosophical, theoretical and empirical texts from Aristotle to contemporary theorists, dissecting their claims and arguments and synthesizing them, if appropriate, critically and coherently. And when Rin reads Andrew's work, particularly the theoretical essays, one is impressed with the way in which he is indeed a very careful reader of the texts in which he engages. And what this multidisciplinarity, sorry, post-disciplinarity does is to enable him to develop new combinations and insights into old and new problems, including contingency and necessity, spatio-temporality, narrative, knowledge as becoming, knowledge as fallible, fallible, inequalities of income wealth, feelings of moral obligation and much else too. And I think that brings me to a conclusion and I slightly slayed over length in contrast to everybody else. Thank you. Well, that was just, that was 
Great. And you threw out, in typical Bob fashion, uh, quite a few challenges there. But uh, I think we have to work out which one Andrew would like to take up. Uh, Ballyhart, you too threw out a challenge to Andrew. You wanted him to write more on political resistance. We also have a really good question that we can take now or maybe later from David Hesmond How. Uh, which I will read out, but let's see if we start off with Balahar's challenge first and then move on to Bob's. Are you under labouring? Um, and see how we go. OK, thank you. OK, so start. Yeah, um, Balahar and thanks, Balahar, and um, I appreciate the work you're doing on um, moral economies in, East, in Central Asia and so on. Um, for those who don't know, the this moral economy thing. Um, when I said all economies are moral economies, you might want to say, well, surely they're immoral economies in many cases. Well, yes, they are, but they're moral in the sense that they have norms about what you're allowed to do and what's expected of you to do. If I give you this, you've got to give me that, you know, and so on. And the whole system depends upon people following those norms. And it's possible for us to question them from a normative point of view. So justifications of property, um, this is my house. Um, I don't want other people just helping themselves to stuff and displacing me. Um, but that just that ju that's used as a justification of huge properties such as those of the Duke of Westminster who owns half of Mayfair and vast areas of countryside near Lancaster, you know which he can't all use himself. It's, that's what J.A. Hobson called improperty. But, you know, the norms governing it are just the same as those which govern your right to you know, have control over a certain space as your home. Um, and you're, Balihar, you're right. In writing about inequalities in the moral economy, I have said too little about resistance. And as you guessed, um, one reason is my reaction against the tendency of radicals, mainly in the past, not so much now, to exaggerate and romanticize the rebelliousness of the oppressed and to exaggerate the precariousness of the social order, you know, forecasting six of the last three crises. And to suppose that, but for strategies of legitimation, mass resistance would surely break out. Well, it won't. And E.P. Thompson, who popularized but did not actually originate the concept of moral economy, was an example of this ten tendency to exaggerate and romanticize resistance. Though in response to, to critics, he did acknowledge that he'd ignored the flag saluting, foreigner hating, peer respecting side of the plebeian mind. And as you know, I, I was indeed much taken with Bourdieu's explanation of the lack of resistance by reference to the simple routine of daily life, the naturalization of certain ways of thinking which become that's how the that's how life works you know get used to it the sense of reality but he took this too far and partly because he took the formation of the habitus as as you said as indifferent to whether the conditions were harmful or beneficial and he said remarkably little about emotional resistance um but it, as you said it, emotional resistance like resentment sense of unfairness doesn't necessarily get beyond even individualized expressions, let alone organized ones. And Bourdieu did acknowledge that resistance can be more painful than client compliance and compliance can be reluctant rather than willing, you know. But nevertheless, there is always likely to be um, some degree of emotional resistance. That, and without that, it's a necessary condition um condition for actually doing anything about anything why why would anybody bother about anything otherwise and we i think we're more aware now how resistance can be deflected or prevented simply by the fact that various groups are divided you know it's not just class there's gender and racism and they all intersect and there's division of labor division of labor really does divide the working class. And um, but then there are divide and rule strategies such as the rights attempt to stir up culture wars and deflect working class attention from the financial upper class onto the liberal left. But you have to say that 
this is reinforced not only by the remoteness of the upper class from the rest of the population, they're just not seen, but it's also sometimes reinforced by middle class, class racism, which Diane has written about. Um, but you're right, I haven't got into that. I know you've written about um, resistance in Central Asia, and it's good to, good to hear about. Um, but I think one would have to know a lot about the cultural and economic history of those, political history of those societies to be able to explain it. You know, what kind of common understandings of what's right and wrong and so on, what's fair and what isn't, are already present in those societies. So you're right, basically. Um, moving on to Bob. Um, regarding critical realism, and I recommend uh, Bob's own um, elaborations of s some features of it in his uh, strategic relational approach. Um, one thing that I would add and, and stress is that critical realism acknowledges the importance of understanding meanings in everyday life. Meaning, meanings and meaningful practices is not just about physical causes, material causes, but it also says, unlike interpretive, it, it also says that meanings, discourses can be causal. That's why we talk to each other to make some kind of difference. Otherwise, communication would be redundant. And but I wanted mainly in relation to Bob to talk about post-disciplinarity post a bit more. I've actually been committed to it, although I didn't think of the name until much later, since the summer of 1978 when I had an epiphany after two years of teaching at Sussex, both in geography and in these interdisciplinary courses, that I, I wanted to be a social scientist and just follow connections wherever they led. And when I applied to Lancaster Sociology, I knew that there was a lot of support for interdisciplinarity and that most colleagues, as Bob said, had done their first degrees in other subjects. And if I did say at the interview it was a post-disciplinary department, I certainly didn't mean that sociology as a subject was post-disciplinary. Such a claim would be absurd. It's a blatant example of disciplinary imperialism. It's not. Anyway, I'm grateful that I've always been allowed to teach and research whatever I wanted here. And also, by the way, I, I already knew John Ari and several other members of the department through an amazing network called the Conference of Socialist Economists which was very big in the late 70s and early 80s. And I, so I would meet John and others at weekend workshops and things, you know. OK. Um, yeah, each discipline has its strengths. There's no doubt about that, but they all have blinkers too. They're simultaneously parochial and imperialist, prone to overextend their claims. And the result is reductionism and various misattributions of causality. And of course, disciplines reward insiders, and that means people who have agreed to limit their chances to be exposed to something different. And by contrast, post-disciplinarity enhances serendipity because it opens you to a more diverse set of intellectual resources. And as Bob notes, I owe so much to reading those what I call pre-disciplinary thinkers. Um, Mark Smith and Mill and even Aristotle 24 centuries ago. Um, they're so useful still. And a lot of the, when social science fragmented into different disciplines at the end of the 19th century, that produces all sorts of problems. Because, for example, political theory and philosophy, they, they're strong on normative reasoning, but they tend to prefer to do it through developing ideal theories of a just free society rather than deal with actually existing societies with their, all their forms of injustice. And it concentrates on the good as if the bad is simply just the absence of the good. And so it's, it's not much use for addressing injustices. But on the other side, you have sociology, which engages a lot with the bad, but is generally reluctant to explore normative issues in any depth. So this is what happens. This happened with the fragmentation of social science into different disciplines. You end up with subjects which have com complementary strengths and weaknesses, which cry out for dialogue. And the other point I want to make is about um, biology, because when I wrote about 
post-disciplinarity in 2000, I assumed that it was just a matter for the social sciences and that we didn't need, didn't need to know anything special about biology. And, and my reasoning for that was that, well, we don't need to know any more than everyday knowledge of physics or chemistry to do social science. So the same applies to biology. Well, I've now changed my mind. And OK, mind and meaning, things that we're interested in social science, are emergent from brains and bodies and social interactions. So I don't need to know what your synapses are doing to understand what you're saying. But thanks to our remarkable neuroplasticity, our experience also modifies our brains and bodies. So our causal powers and susceptibilities change. And I'm not just talking about getting old either. Although always on, they're always changed on the terms of the brain body, never without limit. And as um, the Belgian um, neuroscientist psychologist Bessel van der Kolk says, the body keeps the score. It's modified by what we experience, but it is certainly not merely constructed as they sometimes say by it, or as sociologists sometimes say. And until recently, a lot of social science has been biophobic, resistant to the idea that human biology has any effect on our behavior. If we ask what it is about us, about us humans that makes us so susceptible to socialization, sociology has little to say. So its explanations of socialization tend to be one-sided. They like to, they like trying to clap with one hand. Hence they, hence they frequently end up implying that we are blank slates on which anything can be written. And that, that um, trope keeps getting reinvented in new forms. So new developments regarding the biopsychosocial are very welcome. And the contribution of neuroscience to understanding behavior is one of the things that has interested me in recent years and I may try and write about a bit more. And of course, regarding our relation to nature more broadly, social science's dismissive attitude to biology and the environment has been thoroughly com complicit in the environmental crisis and that needs to change, obviously. So yeah, let's be post-disciplinary or if you prefer, ill-disciplined. Forget disciplines and follow the connections wherever they lead. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I can feel your, your stubborn and righteous indignation coming through there. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, what we're going to do now, we're going to have a short break, but we've got two good questions here that I'm going to, can you see them? Uh, I'm going to uh, read out and what we'll do is we'll put them on hold for you to respond to later. Uh, can you see David Hertzman, how Andrew's writing has been so important to me over the years. There's no social theorist who I turn to more regularly for clarification, guidance and wisdom. However, I have a question about your approach to political and moral economy, Andrew, if I may. It's hugely illuminating about capitalism, but I can't recall you engaging that much with theories of imperialism and colonialism. He says he's not in the country with all his books. But are there any writers and thinkers that you think about? So if you can uh, put that on your list to return to at the end when you do your responses and summary. And uh, another very challenging question from Cameron McAuliffe, I hope that's OK, asking Andrew to reflect on the current strains of social scientific work that variously engage and invoke value and or values. In the absence of a meta theoretical understanding of value, that's contentious. Are we in danger of reproducing past sins, leading to a further hardening of normative and quantitative or perhaps ethical, cultural and political, economic silos of intellectual endeavour? OK, so I'm going to put those on hold because we're meant to be having a very, very quick break till 4.10, just in case people need it. Interestingly, we used to call those bio breaks, Andrew, so I hope you recognise that we put the bio in it. Um, <laughs> so back at 4.10 for everybody on the third panel on colleagues and collegiality. Thank you. Is everybody ready to go? We've got Lizzie, Karen, Corrie, Just, and Linda. Can you give me one minute? Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, of course you've got you three. Yeah, just point the preference for the next I need my central heating on. Oh. 
that's probably a very good idea. Bev, so we've got about five minutes each, haven't we? Because Linda's yes. joined us. She's yes, five, five, five minutes each. I won't be doing big introductions to you. I'll just say that you are our colleagues. So I won't, you know, cite all your books and everything. We realise that, that would take ages. <laughs> say who you are. Um, and then you could say your relationship to him, if that's all right. You know, I know Andrew through kind of thing, um, which would be very nice. So it's sad that we wish to put more time in at the end because those questions are quite complex, but worth worth thinking about. Mm. So we'll wait for those. And the order is, of course, Lizzie, Karen, Corrie and Linda. And then Andrew will respond. I hope he's OK. He did want to have breaks, so it's important that he has them. Yeah. Uh, I might move my desk down and sit down. I think you need a break. Yeah, two hours, you definitely need a break. Yeah, yeah. 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 I know. It's good to see Linda. Hi, Linda. <laughs> Hi, Karen. <laughs> How are you, Linda? I'm I'm fine. Fine. I haven't actually moved. I'm, I'm just selling my house. I've come down to Lancaster to pack up and I uh, don't start till the 1st of December in King's. So I'm in this sort of limbo. Limbo state at the moment, so I'm actually in Lancaster. So you actually had a break between jobs? <clears throat> a couple of months, sort of, because 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 I it was a research leave that I was going to have, so I managed to sort of keep half of it, which is thank God because it's so time consuming moving. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Okay. You're and back. Feeling. Hi. Are you bearing up, Andrew? Are you enjoying this ritual? <laughs> I'll leave that to you. <laughs> I respect your discipline. <laughs> shouldn't generate any hard questions, although you still have to at the end. <laughs> I just heard that Bill Gates is coughing his way through his speech at COP. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> OK, are we going live again? <laughs> yeah, I send you live there. Okay, I need my I need my red circle, otherwise I don't know if I'm live or not. Okay, well welcome back to the final the panel. This this should be actually less serious and more fun, I hope. And everybody's smiling, so that's really, really nice. And the idea was that we would end on collegiality, which already mentioned Andrew is pretty famous for, for supporting other people. So we have got four colleagues at the moment who are going to talk about Andrew. And in order, they are Elizabeth Horton, so that's Lizzie, who is a policy designer in the Department of Education. Then Karen Broadhurst, who's a professor in the department on child uh, justice and, uh, and the Data Science Institute. Uh, Corrine, who's also in the department, who's a professor of social work and heads up the Security Institute. And Linda Woodhead, who is a colleague of Andrew for many years, who studies uh, Sociology of Religion was in the Religious Studies Department, but is that sadly for us moving to King's, and I'm sure very sadly for Andrew too. But we'll go, they've got five minutes each, <laughs> and so we'll go in the order of Lizzie first. Thank you, Lizzie. That's lovely. Thank you, Beverly. Um, and first off, thank you. Ooh. Is that to go? Excellent technical issues. Thank you, Bev, um, and thank you, Lancaster, and indeed, Andrew, for inviting me along to speak today. Um, I had the great pleasure of being one of Andrew's students all the way through. So we did um, Living with Capitalism together as an undergraduate student, through to Contemporary Debates in Social Sciences as a master's student. And finally, Andrew was the main supervisor on my PhD, um, Students' Experiences, Choice, Hope and Everyday Neoliberalism in English Higher Education. And so to co-opt a term, I think I am here today to give the student experience of Andrew. And I can assure you it gets top marks on the NSS or whatever that is called. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, so I wanted to reflect first on the fact that actually the only reason I did the PhD was because Andrew had encouraged me to do so. I was one of those students who would never have thought of doing one in the first place um, because academia was one of those worlds that just didn't come into my kind of my habitus. Um, so as first off, a big thank you to Andrew for that encouragement. Um, and I think really it was very typical reflecting back of Andrew to encourage a undergraduate student who, to be honest, hadn't properly read the essay question for the first essay she ever did for him. He was very generous in his feedback on that, but did remind me to make sure that I was properly looking at the question rather than just writing about what I wanted to write about. Um, but Andrew has always been so open with his thoughts, encouraging with the feedback, and I think particularly what I want to talk about is being empowering through his teaching, because that's one of the ways that I really think Andrew lives and breathes the values that he writes about as well. So there was one particular, actually one particular fortnight from being an undergraduate in, in the Living with Capitalism um, course that I remember and it's the week, the fortnight that Andrew got us to do problem-based learning. So problem-based learning is of course a technique that came across from the medical school but Andrew very sensibly had thought actually we can use this not just to diagnose medical ills and medical causes but let's apply the same technique to thinking about social ills, social conditions, thinking about what, not, what are the symptoms but also what are the root causes. Now I can't remember what the exact scenario was, the exact problem we were trying to um, solve but I think for me that really was the first time that it clicked that sociology wasn't just a theoretical practice, it was something that you could put into practice as well. It was some, a tool to take away and to use in the real world to tackle inverted commas real world problems. The second reflection that I had was one that has already been raised actually today and that was a discussion that we had during the master's course and that was particularly about Michael Bourre and public sociology. And I think again, that has stuck with me because it seemed to so much embody what Andrew was about, which was always making sure that the discipline of the people, the discipline of society was something that could be understood. It shouldn't just be locked away in ivory towers. It should be something that is put into language and put into um, terminology that anybody could access and use for themselves and certainly I know that looking back and being an undergraduate student, Andrew, some of your writings were by far the most accessible. And I think that counts for a lot actually in terms of getting people to engage properly with these critical theories and to be able to feel comfortable with then applying them, whether that's as an undergraduate or as somebody who has come through and been studying sociology and being a sociologist for many, many years. And then finally, um, the PhD and I know we had many, many a discussion um, around what education should look and feel like um, that again has been sort of taken into uh, what I've been able to do within the Department for Education now. Um, but I think again what particularly spoke to me reflecting back was the fact that you never chided me for being too much involved in university politics when I probably should have been doing more writing. <laughs> um, and a reflection that I didn't have at the time, I must admit, being a anxious PhD student who was always concerned that they should be doing more writing, um, that actually that in itself was putting into practice those conversations we were having. It was recognising that universities, education, sociology, all of these things don't just happen in, um, in journal articles, they don't just happen in the seminar rooms, it should be something that is out there being um, an active conversation and that means um, turning up on UCU picket lines, which I can remember bumping into you a couple of times on, but also I think particularly for me, the solidarity shown backwards um, to the student movement and showing that actually this artificial divide between lecturers and the university and then the students was, um, was a case of divide and conquer and actually it does work better when we look at things um, more holistically and we understand that the issues affecting one group within academia are actually the issues of everybody. So that was 
possibly a belated but a big thank you for turning up on the 2010 student march which <laughs> I can remember you carrying the UCU banner along for. Um, so those really have been my kind of reflections stepping back. It's been four years now since I've been in academia um, and I think the, the tools you have given me are ones that I've been able to take on and pass on to other people. So I now look to be an empowering teacher in the way you taught. Um, I have been recommending several of your books to my boyfriend who is just about to start his own PhD in socio-legal studies and is a bit unsure about what methodology to be using. Um, and that continues to come through. So as a social scientist, as a teacher, you've been empowering and I think really that's what this should all come down to. So thank you, Lancaster is going to short, slowly, slowly miss you, but it sounds like you're not going to be too far away from them. That was lovely, Lizzie. Thank you so much. And over to Karen. Hi, Bev. Hello, Andrew. So thank you, Bev and Michael, for inviting me to this really special occasion. Um, thank you so much for the lively and engaging discussion so far. And I'm delighted to be part of this group who are celebrating the huge contribution of our dear friend, Andrew. So hello, Andrew. Um, this is more a, um, you know, a personal uh, account of a uh, little bit of a personal anecdote about my uh, friendship with Andrew, but also Andrew's contribution to the department and to the university. Um, so where should we start? OK, collegiality, Andrew, we've already heard that you're scoring top marks um, against the, against this um, imperative that we're trying to hold on to. So, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that Lancaster University is an institution which still prides itself on its co collegiality and its community. We all know that the Academy is increasingly characterised by competitive individualism, but at Lancaster we've strived to avoid these excesses um, and to be generous with our colleagues. Um, Diane today has eloquently um, described the, you know, the metrics and these kind of rather pernicious incentives that structure our, our daily lives. But I think it is thanks to you, colleagues like you, Andrew, um, that we're reminded to take a critical step back uh, and to think about what kind of culture we want for ourselves. Um, the Department of Sociology continues to be quite exemplary, I think, in the university in terms of how we organise our energies collectively. You know, not every day. We have bad days, but we, we try to work together ethically uh, against an, in the face of an ever increasing array of demands that are made of, of us and the kind of increasing complexity and specialisation of roles. OK, so in the introduction today, Anne-Marie um, and followed by many colleagues today has described you as consistently generous in your contribution to the department. So I'm going to give some examples of that. Uh, but I think, um, you know, knowing you quite well personally, Andrew, although I've not seen much of you during the pandemic, hopefully that will change. And um, there's no there's no doubt, Andrew, that you have helped to shape the culture of the department past and present. And I think this is in part um, due to your lengthy engagement with questions of what it means to value people and our normative sentiments and the ethical commitments that we make in our everyday lives. And, and they are, I think, particularly important features of your scholarship um, that you bring into and infuse the culture of our department. I think um, it's been invaluable, your work in helping both staff and students to think critically about how we navigate the range of pressures that we face and what kind of culture we want. And we've heard that from Lizzie today as well. So Andrew, you've certainly reminded me on a number of occasions, I don't know if I've listened sufficiently, um, but you've reminded me of what matters to people and encouraged me to um, think about things like work-life balance, although I'm not entirely sure you're the best role model, um, but you've certainly encouraged me not to, not to forget that. So let's turn now to some practical uh, examples of Andrew's contribution to departments. So we, we know that Andrew was previously a serving hard. This is a particularly challenging role where individuals find themselves sandwiched between the needs of the department, ever increasing in size and complexity, and at the same time trying to satisfy or at least appease um, the aspirations of senior management. I think often when HOS have done this very challenging and difficult job, it's, you know, job done, I've done my bit, I'm walking away. But what I've seen in you, Andrew, is a, is a commitment to showing, uh, giving support to, to uh, new HOS and the leadership team and importantly to demonstrate care towards your, your colleagues in your 
everyday world. Um, you have um, formally and informally supported the academic careers of many junior colleagues, me for one. So I first met you when we began supervising a student that I'm going to say a little bit more about in a minute. Um, but I think you, you know, you assisted me in a, a sort of gentle but advisory way um, about how to uh, empower students, as Lizzie said. Um, and I think I think, it, you know, it's a real it's a real uh, it's to your credit that you have actually personally supported the careers of many national and international doctoral students. And even now, post retirement, you're still uh, steering those doctoral students to completion. OK, so I think, yes, your work is best described as post-disciplinary. I think it's been really useful for the department that you've been wanted. You've wanted to follow connections and see where they lead um, to quote you today. Um, and I think you've made done a really good job of locating the Department of Sociology in an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary or post-disciplinary landscape and through um, the contribution to the life of the university, conferences, seminars, etc you have helped to foster connections between our department and the many disciplines that surround us. In the latter part of your career, Andrew, you also were active in the union and you said to me, I wanted to do something useful. And I kind of thought, well, the books were quite useful, Andrew. But you know, you said to me, this is a kind of practical challenge that I need to take on. Um, I didn't envy it, envy it one bit, but I could see that you were absolutely um, designed to do this work. Um, at least intellectually. <laughs> OK, so let's move on now to my final um, parting words. So on a more personal note, I, I got to know Andrew um, really closely through co-supervising a PhD student. Um, this student was a, a wonderful student, but a part time student. I think it's fair to say, Andrew, that he took a fairly long time to complete his PhD studies. But the, the upside of that was that it led to uh, many car journeys, uh, dinners, particularly at the student's house. It was quite a long drive to his house um, where uh, you and I were able to talk in, in quite a lot of depth, actually. And I received quite a lot of tips um, I was a psychologist. I had a lot of um, really useful mini lectures from you on complex sociological concepts, but also tips on insomnia and, um, you know, how recommended reading uh, and obviously, you know, how to how to navigate the dinner with our students. Um, uh, so yeah, all, all kinds of wonderful personal exchanges took place. I think that created a nice bond between us, which we've we've continued. We've not seen much of each other recently, but I'm really hoping um, that we uh, will meet will meet up again around the department. Um, so just to finally final word to say that, you know, as we move forward, facing an increasing um, challenges in the university and in the department uh, in terms of our roles and responsibilities, downward pressure on resources, you know, ever more, do less, do, do more with less. It's really important that we hold on to the lessons that we've learned from our senior colleagues like you, Andrew, um, who have served as outstanding role models in the department. And I think in an, in an environment of increasing uncertainty and unpredictability, um, it's really important that we all recognise um, the most valuable assets in the university, which are its people. And the, and the culture they create. So thank you, Andrew, and looking forward to the next lunch invitation. Hope it's soon. <laughs> thank you very much, Karen, and over to you, Karine. OK, thanks. Um, so I ha I could, you know, add so much to that because it's just brilliant. Uh, I was going to endorse what a generous colleague Andrew is and a great person to co-supervise in terms of PhDs. Um, but I want to use this opportunity to thank him for one contribution in particular, and that's sort of more personal. Um, uh, I was aware of Andrew's work before he came to Lancaster, and at the time I was a sociology PhD student and very suitably respectful of his work on method. And I now recommend it to all my students struggling with those big questions about epistemology, realism and all of that. And uh, they inevitably end up there and just say, go read, go read Andrew's work, uh, which is fantastic. Thank you for that. <laughs> he uh, has obviously done a lot since. Um, but it was his book, Why Things Matter to People, that has had the most profound effect, impact on me and my work in recent years. 
And I remember when I read it, I went to hot foot to his office to, to sort of tell him and to talk about it. And he looked absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> And I think partly that was because at the time I'd just finished being head of department and um, and and obviously Andrew was used to me going to him and saying, oh, can you do this or can you do that? And of course, he would always pretty much always say yes. So uh, I think he was probably waiting for me to give him some work. But, um, you know, I read a lot and mostly you know, at the moment I'm reading lots and lots of articles on autonomous systems and computational approaches to things. Um, and so Andrew's injunction to consider why things uh, matter to people might seem a bit of a distance away, but I want to illustrate its application because I think it's so important to, have to, to think about how these things, we take these things from our colleagues and this, we work with wonderful colleagues um, and, and how we can absorb them into our work. So at the time that I read that, I was taking a systematic review on online facilitated child sexual abuse as the basis for a serious exploration of online child sexual victimisation. And uh, it was the courage that Andrew's work gave me, and I don't think it can be overstated, because what more about this harm needed to be said? After all, you know, child abuse is almost unanimously regarded as a bad thing. Politicians, parents, victims and the public want social scientists to state just how bad it is and how it can be stopped. How dare we question what it is when there are such institutionally inscribed definitions that tell us just exactly what it is? And some of those I've written myself. Um, or what is the harm it causes? So, so these are big questions, but Andrew opened that path for me, uh, just as a doctor, he says in, in that book, <clears throat> just as a doctor may point out asymptomatic forms of ill being, such as carcinoma, social scientists may point out unnoticed as well as recognised forms and sources of ill being. So things may not be as explicit as they first appear. And so begins the justification for us to enter into the world of moral matters. Andrew cautions that in doing so, forgetting the political is a danger. Political matters can't be displaced by ethics. And uh, he also cautions an ethics without politics is in danger of being ineffective. And he says we can't resolve problems whose roots lie in social structures that support exploitation, domination and neglect merely by being nicer. Now, this resonated with me because I'm surrounded constantly and have been for decades on calls to end child abuse, calls to end online, in this case that I was focusing on online child sexual victimisation. But what that was pointing to was how those things cannot in themselves be effective. Calls cannot work. Uh, and the politics of online harm must also be our subject. Witness the recent expose of Facebook and its role in online harm and the platform is not alone, driven by surveillance capitalism, which of course Bev's done so much on. Um, so ending child abuse has to be more than a moral position. Uh, it has to be a political one as well, and we have to uh, work at that. And Andrew observes that critical, to which I would add most social scientists who use such terms, and he, use, he gives the example of abuse, racism and so on, tend to leave the reason why their reference might be bad implicit. They might just assume that their readers already accept these evaluations or assume they're so obvious as to not need defending. But they are likely to be aware that if they go beyond these terms and dwell upon the justifications that lie behind them, they're likely to be accused of importing their own values into the analysis as if these could only be a contaminant. And it's that silence that I think echoes through a huge range of social problems that we uh, kind of attend to. And when it comes to child sexual abuse, this is keenly felt, it feels very unsafe to start, um, you know, sort of going into it and leaving the reasons why their reference might be bad implicit. 
Uh, so, and it's also a problem with, uh, you know, consequentialism and including both victim claims to harm, which are loud and rightly so, and the scientific pursuit of evidence of harm, as if both in and of themselves should be accepted at face value. This is a bad. This is how bad it is. And that runs through a lot of the social problems literature. And deeper inquiry has risks. How to avoid not being seen in this case on the side of paedophiles, literally child lovers, or abolitionists and extreme religious groups that would, you know, sort of stop children from doing all kinds of things and yet still offer a critical analysis that interrogates why and how child sexual abuse is a bad, i.e. is a moral harm. And I think Andrew gave me, well I know, he gave me the courage to do that. That book gave me the courage to do that, to go back to Freud and Foucault and to find that children are inherently, or to reinforce that, I kind of knew, we, we knew it, but nobody's saying it, that children are inherently sexual beings and to give voice to that finding, to find that, lo that love is political and moral, and love power, and Andrew and I have discussed this one, it is an intrinsic actor in much sexual abuse, which can, connects to a fundamental moral harm. And that is, of course, of breaking trust, not just here and now, but as a disposition. When trust goes within intimate relationships, all relationships become questionable. And the other thing that, that really spurred me on was a, a key point reinforced by Andrew in that book, was that treating people equally where they differ in relevant respects is an injustice because it fails to do justice to the relevant particularities. Children are not homogenous. Childhoods change over time. So um, where are the relevant particularities of children when it comes to sexual relations? Vulnerabilities are diverse. Um, and just to give you an example, I, I use this in my book. This is a comment from a diary study from a, a, a boy. He said, I viewed some pornographic content and some excessive violence. I intended for both to happen. Hear me out. I'm a 15 year old boy and the violence was from a video game. I was playing with a friend. And the boy complained not about the content he was viewing, which is the often presented harm, the moral harm by parents, teachers and governments, but about homophobic comments he received in the video game. So digging into diversity enables us to get closer to the politics, the hierarchies, the cultures of harms. Should we ban all pornographic content for children or take a more diverse approach, which is currently unsupportable and even sometimes you feel like it's unthinkable and unsayable. But Andrew's work urges us to be brave, to do justice to the relevant particularities rather than follow slogans and wholesale bans. Finally, shame, which Andrew, I think in that book is, you know, there's really good coverage of it, is a particularly significant emotion. And in relation to child sexual abuse, survivors of sexual abuse often talk about feelings of shame. And Andrew points out that shame is about something, that negative feelings of, sh of shame are about positive, positively valued norms and practices. So this points to an important therapeutic message in his work. Removing shame is not just a matter of trying to get rid of the feeling, but of correcting what it is about. So messages to victims such as it wasn't your fault only partially do that. If it's not their fault, then whose? The perpetrator. But aren't they also victims and also likely to be ashamed or shamed? Uh, as social scientists, I believe Andrew is proposing we go deeper into the cultural contradictions that allow sex and youth to be commodities in the cultural political economy and yet preserve the innocence of childhood. And whilst others have identified these contradictions, no one to my knowledge has upheld that cultural, contradict cultural contradiction is in itself potentially a moral harm. And where would that lead? Um, okay. so, yeah. Yeah. On to <laughs> Linda, or are we going to run out of time? Uh, 
We'll have to cut the event. I just that. wanted to say thank you then to Andrew for encouraging us all to enter the uncomfortable places and to find out why they or you care about anything. Thank you very much, Corinne. Over to Linda. Andrew, dear friend, um, thank you so much, Bev and Michael, for the invitation. Um, I'm the kind of Halloween act because I appear as Andrew's shadow side in this event because I'm not a sociologist, really. I'm, I'm religious studies and, and sociology of religion, which is a very marginal and difficult part of, of the sociology because religion is, in a way, sociology is other as well. You know, sociology is constructed against the pre-modern uh, religious um, in a progressive stages. We can go back to Comte or whatever, or we can look at Marx. We can think of all sorts of reasons why sociology has found religion difficult. And when I first met Andrew, a long time ago now, Andrew, I think Andrew had um, Andrew himself believed a lot of this and we immediately got on with each other, but we always had this bone of contention. I think Andrew thought, what the hell is this woman doing looking at this, uh, this terrible area of social life that ought to disappear? Um, and I think Andrew and I have been on a sort of parallel, not parallel journey, I mean parallel journey holding hands if you can have such a thing. Um, and I hope that I have convinced him that he had absorbed uh, a particular view of religion, which is the view that people with religious power um, uh, and forms of religion which support privilege want to put forward. And they want to say that other forms of spiritual practice are superstition and magic and nonsense and individualized and trivial. And what's so interesting about my um, my lifetime, our lifetimes, is that we're living through a period in which the old orthodox forms of religion in this country, the churches, have, have collapsed and they've lost moral authority and they've been involved in terrible scandals like sex abuse and cover up, as Corinne and I have often talked about. Uh, but other forms of spirituality, alternative from tarot to psychics to et cetera, et cetera, have, have therefore got a voice now. And they're what fascinate me. And I've spent a lot of time doing empirical work with people in those worlds. And they are spaces where people who aren't academics uh, can think and feel and join together and imagine and resist and find resources and do all sorts of useful and interesting things. And Andrew has actually, Andrew, I'm going to, I'm going to assume this anyway. Uh, Andrew has been on a bit of a journey with this with me too um, <laughs> and has even been involved in some of these groups to some extent. Uh, so this illustrates his openness, his generosity, his post-disciplinary breadth and the way in which it's like all great thinkers, your life and your reflection, you know, they ping pong back and they, they cycle up together. And just to finish with a very huge overgeneralization, uh, you know, I think social science tends to be very comfortable with thinking and discourse and words, and it's pretty comfortable with practice and doing. If you think about four bits of a quadrant, those are the two bits, but the other two bits of life, which are about feeling and emotions, was getting better, but it's found it quite hard. <laughs> and the final bit, let's call it breathing, <laughs> the body, take a breath. How are you feeling in your in your gut? Um, it got a lot of problems with that. It's got a lot of problems with the biological and the natural. And you know, I'm not even going to get into non-human agency. But Andrew, Andrew embraces all those in a wonderful holistic way. And it's an inspiration and it brings so much to the, to the field. And Andrew, you've been a dear friend to me at Lancaster and an intellectual companion. And I love you lots. <laughs> That's wonderful. I could I could feel the love coming through from everybody. So what we have here at the end, Andrew, before you get a chance to respond, is the comments about courage, kindness, support, openness, collegiality, generosity and being a great thinker and clearly greatly loved. 
Some people have had to leave, but they also say huge respect to you and thank you so much for enabling them to do the work that they can do. So I hope you're hearing this. I know you're not one for compliments, but I really hope you're hearing this because a lot of people wanted to tell you this. So I'll now hand it over to you so you can respond and have the final say because I do know you like that. So over to you, Andrew. You're on mute. <laughs> well, that's a that's appropriate because maybe in Linda's quadrant there's what cannot be said as well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a bit blown away. You didn't want me to ask those earlier questions to answer those earlier questions, did you? But anyway, but um, no, I'll, I'll just respond to you because um, Several of you have spoke to, spoken about co-supervision and that's been fantastic. It's, for me, it's been the one bit of the job which reminds me of the old days when we could actually learn from colleagues. You know, that's one of the main reasons why I, I, I didn't want to just chuck it in, you know. And so working with Anne-Marie and, and Corinne most recently has been terrific and lots of colleagues as before that. And um, Yes, it's strange, isn't it, being an academic? You write these books and they're sent off into nowhere and you wonder if anybody reads them and what the hell do they make of them? And it's nice when people come up with things which I wouldn't have expected, but when you met, when you actually explain it, I think, oh yeah, I suppose it does really. Um, but that's great. And thank you, Lizzie, for this, the student experience, <laughs> one student experience. Um, you're a pretty special student because you mentioned the um, problem-based learning, which was a new experiment for me. I had to take a, a few tranquilizers before those sessions, but um, it required um, students to run the class. And I remember you volunteered to do one of the roles. And I actually thought you were so good at uh, involving everyone else. I wish I could teach like that. And, get the students to respond, you know. But anyway, th thanks so much. And that was a pleasure. And thank you all so much. Um, there are some other things I did want to say, and obviously to thank um, Bev and Michael and Kevin and Diane and Balihar and Bob for setting it up and for their contributions. But I also wanted to say that one of the first things that, that struck me when I came to Lancaster in 1993, and this was a new experience for, for me, was the quality of support from professional services. Mm -hmm. And um, actually Karen, other Karen, Karen Gammon has been at Lancaster even longer than, than, than me and has outlasted me. And it blew me away the, the amount of support, the skill and the can-do attitude that I've always got from professionals services the names change but and so particularly Karen and her the people who have worked with her in that and especially Claire O'Donnell who was department secretary when I was head of department thank you so much that makes our job so much easier and I know you give fantastic support to the students and I've also been struck in the last 20 years in particular particular by the quality of the teaching I mean the commitment I, I see um, from colleagues when I've been in the department is incredible that they give to teaching and administration, the preparation and the care which they give. And I wish the university would be impressed and re recognise this and be impressed, it damn well should be. But I would say also be gentle on yourselves. You know, it's scary sometimes seeing how on the ball you are. And uh, it's been a fantastic department because um, it's combined intellectual um, excellence with a down-to-earth attitude. You don't have to be an elitist and, you know, and um, put on a persona of grandeur of anything like or distance to be good. And I, I've always valued that. So um, talking of work, I do still do a bit occasionally when it's when it's raining. So I've been doing a lot recently and uh, I intend to do a bit more. And so um, it would be nice to keep in touch. I'd like to come to the occasional seminar. Um, I've learned things from you 
just listening you now, listening to you now, which I hadn't known about, and I'd like to know more. So, yeah, everybody, keep keep in touch, and a big uh, socially distanced but well-meaning hug to you all. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and there's more comments coming in, which we will keep for you so that you can see uh, where people say how kind you've been and influential you've been to them. Um, so thank you so much. Um, you have actually, I thought you'd want longer at the end, so I'm sorry I cut you off, Corinne. I thought we were going to run out of time, but uh, uh, you don't want to answer those questions, Andrew. So we'll just end by saying thank you, Andrew. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.